we present a case of repeat lysis of adhesions for severe Asherman syndrome. Our objectives are to demonstrate our experience with repeat procedures for intrauterine adhesions, to review strategies to reduce recurrence of intrauterine adhesions, and to review key obstetrical risks for pregnancies following adhesiolysis. Often used interchangeably, intrauterine adhesions refers to the presence of fibrotic tissue within the uterine cavity, resulting in adherence of opposing surfaces. Asherman syndrome includes the presence of intrauterine adhesions in addition to clinical features such as amenorrhea, hypomenorrhea, subfertility, recurrent pregnancy loss, or history of abnormal placentation. Synechia are thought to arise due to traumatization of already fragile endometrium. Procedures commonly associated with intrauterine adhesions include postpartum DNC, recurrent therapeutic abortions, and DNC for retained products at conception. Caesarean section is also felt to be a risk factor given the possibility to traumatize the gravid endometrium. Our case involves a 40-year-old Gravido 1 Para 1 with no prior history of infertility. She had a cesarean section at 32 weeks and presented with secondary infertility. Her periods had significantly changed following her cesarean delivery. Ultrasound demonstrated thin endometrium with multiple cystic spaces. Sonohistogram was attempted, but the catheter could not be advanced through the cervical loss. Asherman syndrome was suspected and hysteroscopic adhesiolysis was planned. Other modalities for diagnosis include hysterosalpingogram and 3D ultrasound. Initial cavity entry can be challenging as adhesions can involve the upper portion of the cervix. A bimanual exam is paramount prior to commencing. Direct entry into the cervix is preferred to decrease perforation or false passage. In this case, you can see the camera is maintained in a midline orientation. A series of twisting motions with gentle cephalad pressure is used to help traverse the narrow cervix. Additionally, pressurized saline is used to aid with hydrodissection. Our preferred approach is to use a 5.5 mm operative hysteroscope and a combination of scissors and graspers. This is preferred over the use of electrosurgery to minimize injury to existing endometrium. In this case, a blind end cavity is encountered. Scissors are used to interrogate the tissue followed by a push, spread, cut series of movements. Care is taken to minimize axial deviation. In this video from another case, excess deviation to one side results in perforation. Because there was no suspicion of intraperitoneal injury and the site was hemostatic, the hysteroscope was able to be reoriented and the case finished. Dissection is carried cephalad towards the fundus and laterally towards the ostia. Dissection is also carried into the lateral walls of the cavity. For mild and moderate disease, these cases can be performed in an outpatient setting and often with no systemic sedation. When severe disease is expected, our preference is to perform these in the operating room as the procedure can be upwards of 30 minutes and the patient will still get some discomfort if dissection is carried into the innervated myometrium, which helps with identifying and remaining in the appropriate trajectory. Shown here, vessels indicate entry into the myometrium. Hysteroscopic graspers can be used to extract excess fibrotic tissue. At the end, both tubal osteas should be visible from the internal cervical loss. The rate of recurrence is reported as high as 22% for moderate cases and 65% for severe cases. In order to decrease the rate of recurrence, two important concepts are of interest. First, the endometrium should be separated to avoid agglutination. The most commonly used in our preferred approach is the placement of an intrauterine Foley catheter for seven days. While evidence is limited, placement of an IUD has also been described. A less common method is intermittent distension of the cavity every one to two weeks with office hysteroscopy. A fourth method which has increasing evidence is placement of an adhesion barrier, most commonly hyaluronic acid gel, which is not readily available in Canada at this time. The second important principle is endometrial regeneration. Because the basalis layer has often been destroyed, regeneration of the endometrium can be challenging. Several approaches have been described. The most common and our preferred is hormone therapy with an extended treatment of estrogen followed by progesterone. The use of post-operative amnion grafts have also been described. Two newer approaches involve the use of platelet-rich plasma or menstrual stem cells. Both of these have promising results in recent small randomized trials. These products are still experimental. In our experience, endometrial regeneration is cumulative and progressive over the course of multiple procedures. In patients who are planning pregnancy, sonohistograms are routinely arranged one to four months following their initial procedure. Shown here is a repeat sonohistogram for our patient. Shown in yellow is an area of persistent adhesion near the fundus. Shown in red, although less obvious, is limited cavity distension, which suggests persistent adhesions in the lower uterine segment. It is important to note that imaging findings do not always correlate well with hysteroscopic findings. On second look, the endometrium appears much more healthy, consistent with the progressive regeneration of endometrium. Based on preoperative imaging, lower uterine adhesions are expected. 
Again, a seemingly short cavity is encountered. The upper border of this is probed with the tip of the hysteroscope, and eventually the fundal portion of the uterine cavity is entered. Scissors are then used to divide adhesions both at the fundus and in the lower uterine segment in order to completely open up the cavity. Notably, at the end of this procedure, there appears to be much more functional endometrium. A pediatric Foley catheter is then placed at the end of the procedure for 7 days along with 21 days of estradiol and 7 days of medroxyprogesterone acetate. Three months following the procedure, our patient spontaneously conceived. She is currently 28 weeks gestation with a complete anterior placenta previa and no evidence of placenta accreta. The most common reason for treatment is desired pregnancy. Data on pregnancy outcomes are retrospective and heterogeneous. Clinical pregnancy rates range from 44 up to 64% and live birth rates range from 62 to 75%. Importantly, there are some high-risk features of these pregnancies, including spontaneous abortion, ectopic pregnancy, mid-trimester loss, and perhaps most importantly, placenta accreta. For these reasons, it is important to involve maternal fetal medicine in the care of patients with previous hysteroscopic adhesiolysis. In summary, we have presented a case of hysteroscopic adhesiolysis for severe Ashermans, where repeat procedure resulted in a good outcome. We have described an approach to optimize success, including direct cervical entry, hydrodistension, gentle interrogation of tissue, and awareness of axial deviation. We have described approaches to decrease incidence and severity of recurrence by promoting endometrial separation and regeneration. It's important to remember for both physicians and patients that persistence pays off and recurrence should be expected and planned for in severe cases. Finally, pregnancies after hysteroscopic adhesiolysis for severe Ashermans come with significantly elevated risks, particularly of placenta accreta.